Hey, Courtney. Hey, Ashley. Do you love hearing about true crime and history and other fun stuff? Oh, you know I do. Well, good, because that's what we talk about every week on the Cult of Domesticity podcast, so I'm glad that you enjoy it. Oh, I probably should have known that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Tell them where to find us. Well, we're available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Podbean, and other fun places. New episodes come out pretty much every Thursday. So be there or be square. <laughs> This is Murderous Minors, Killer Kids, bringing you the frightening and truly insane tales of children with the thirst to kill. Kindergarten through 12th grade murderers. True stories thoroughly researched. Join us weekly for new tales of parents' worst nightmares on Murderous Minors, Killer Kids. Episode number seven. Have you seen Brad? Welcome back, Murderous Miners listeners, and thank you for joining me on this episode about friends. War Baby has a great best friend. Her name is Maribel, and she lives in Ahwatukee, Arizona, where this next story took place. Remember being a kid when a school holiday meant sleeping in and lounging around if you were lucky? Jumping on your bike or your skateboard and venturing out to meet up with the kids in the neighborhood, warm, fuzzy, and conspiratorial in the revelation that you should be at school, but you're not. Well, Veterans Day 1995 in Ahwatukee, Arizona, was no different. Ahwatukee is technically the southernmost part of Phoenix, bordered to the north by South Mountain, to the south and west by the Gila River Indian Community, and to the east by Interstate 10. It's considered a swanky community with massive homes snuggled into foothills with wildlife preserves, surroundings, and views. On that November 10th, 1995, around 6.55 a.m., 13-year-old Brad Hansen hopped on a bike that he had rented from a neighbor for $2 to go hang with friends, not having reminded his folks that there was no school that day. Brad headed over to Ahwatukee Custom Estates to the home where his friend, 13-year-old Jeremy Bach, had been staying with his former stepdad, Dan Bach, since September. Brad Hansen and Jeremy Bach were both 13-year-old 7th graders at Centennial Middle School, and on that Veterans Day, Brad rode the bike over to Jeremy's as if he were going to school. It would take a few hours before Brad's mom, Rhonda, is reminded by a co-worker that it was a school holiday. She paged him a few times in nostalgic 1995 fashion, but no answer. She figured by around 12.30 he would call, but he didn't. By 2 p.m., she had heard nothing from her only child, and Rhonda left work to figure out where he was. She went home to see if he had been there throughout the day and ended up calling the Bach residence. When Jeremy answered, she was irritated and asked him to put Brad on the phone. Jeremy said Brad wasn't there, that he had been there super early that morning, but later in the day he had left saying he would come back, but he hadn't. Rhonda drove through the neighborhoods in search of her son, ultimately reporting him missing that evening. Since Brad and Jeremy were known to be friends, police eventually speak to him about whether he had seen Brad that day. He admitted that they had seen each other that Veterans Day morning. He tells police a shocking and unexpected story, that Brad had found a three fifty seven Magnum that his stepfather kept hidden under a couch cushion, fired the gun, then fled on his bike in a panic. No search of the premises was deemed appropriate then, likely because it wasn't apparent that a crime had been committed. That is, unless you count that unlawful discharge of a firearm by a minor that Jeremy just admitted to. For the next two months, that would be that. 13-year-old Brad Hansen would be classified as a runaway for the next eight weeks. His parents fantasized over those first few days that he was showing his independence, having a short adventure somewhere. But he was such a creature of habit who loved his cozy bed, his fresh, clean clothes, and his home-cooked meals. He didn't possess what his mother adorably referred to as street smarts. Rhonda and Jeremy could not imagine their boy just taking off. 
but the alternative scenarios were just downright unfathomable. Rhonda speculated that she drove past the Bach residence in excess of 15 times during that first week Brad was missing. Rumors were circulating around the Centennial Middle School community that a shooting had taken place over at the Bach house. Brad's parents were angry, but they thought for sure that by Sunday he would stroll in. But still, nothing. Gone for Thanksgiving, missing from the family table meant as a place for everyone to share their blessings. Missing for Christmas, his parents put out the tree stand but were waiting for his return for him to pick the tree. Absent from the New Year festivities, an empty seat in each of his 7th grade classes at Centennial Middle School from November 10th up to a week or so into the second semester of that school year. It wasn't until January 9th, 1996, when city sanitation workers were on their routine pickup through Ahwatukee Custom Estates, that clues as to Brad Hansen's possible fate were finally noticed. When emptying the 90-gallon trash bin outside Dan Bach's home, dried blood was identified both on top and on the sides of the receptacle. Enough dried blood was present that the workers notified police. Upon closer, more technical inspection of the trash bin, it was realized that the inside of the lid and the walls were splattered with blood, which had run down the sides to form a pool of blood and other human bodily fluids two inches deep at the bottom. Even more compelling evidence was found inside of Dan Bach's Ahwatukee home, including two unsecured handguns, and there were blood-stained grout between some of the ceramic tiles on the kitchen floor and blood on the seat and leg of a kitchen chair. There was also a bullet hole in the kitchen wall. By this time, January 1996, Jeremy Bach had moved to Las Vegas to live with his mother, Brittany Brown. After he'd already gone, he was indicted by the grand jury once the blood evidence and guns were recovered from his stepdad's house. Dan Bogg contends that he was at work that Veterans Day morning and that all his guns were properly secured. He denied even hearing any rumors of a shooting having occurred at his house and did nothing to explain the bullet hole in the kitchen. Mid-February of 1996, Jeremy is questioned in Las Vegas. Once presented with the mound of incriminating evidence gathered from his former residence, the initial story he gave investigators quickly morphed into something much more sinister. Now remember, when he was questioned by police around the time of Brad's disappearance, he told investigators that Brad had found the gun in the couch, accidentally fired it, and took off on his bike, frightened. Now, though, he wavers back and forth on some of the details, but the sobering, horrifying conclusion is one that the evidence was already pointing towards. Jeremy had shot Brad and put his body in the trash bin. He tells police it took Brad over an hour to die, during which time he did nothing to render aid or summon help. He simply started cleaning up the blood while waiting for his friend to stop moving. He recounts grabbing the gun from under the sofa cushion, recalls walking into the kitchen and bumping into the table when the gun accidentally discharges, striking Brad right near his heart with the bullet exiting and leaving a hole in the kitchen wall. Jeremy says he rolled the trash bin into the kitchen and waited to move the body until he saw no signs of life coming from his friend. He then placed him in a sitting position inside the 90-gallon trash can. He left the lid of the can open for about an hour or so, thinking that Brad would hop out, saying that he was just messing with him. But that didn't happen, so he closed it. Jeremy reiterated that he didn't do nothing until the blood and tissue stopped coming out from the gaping hole by his friend's heart. He did nothing until Brad's chest stopped heaving, until the gurgling noises ceased. He did nothing until Brad slumped over and closed his eyes. He did nothing. Brittany Brown had just allowed her 13-year-old son to be interrogated alone with no parent or lawyer present. Investigators don't believe the accidental part of Jeremy's story and theorize to him that this was over a girl, a 13-year-old classmate named Jennifer that he had been dating but who had become interested in Brad. Throughout the course of their investigation, detectives learned that Jeremy Bach had told his cousin Toby about the murder. The cousin said that while doing homework at the kitchen table in Dan Bach's Ahwatukee home, Jeremy just blurted out, we were sitting right here when it happened. When that kid was shot, I didn't even think that the gun would go off, but the next thing I knew, he was dead. 
His cousin, just a child himself, shook it off as a joke, not understanding the implications of these details at that time. Since Brad was considered a runaway, and Jeremy had yet to give any of the statements to police indicating that the gun accidentally discharged and that Brad had been killed. Further unnerving revelations came when a teacher at Centennial Middle School told police that just two weeks prior to the Veterans Day shooting, she had overheard a red-faced Jeremy Bach mutter, I'm gonna kill him. And when she asked to whom he was referring, he told her, Brad Hansen, and that he was trying to steal his woman. She said she told him, look around. There were plenty of women to choose from, but he said, no, no, I'm going to kill him. The teacher stated that she sent him off to his next class and later recounted the story to fellow teachers in the lounge. They got a chuckle out of it because they could not possibly fathom that a 13-year-old could be that upset over a girl. Jeremy's English teacher told police that, around Thanksgiving, the class was reading Edgar Allan Poe's Fall of the House of Usher, a woeful tale about a man who was terrified that his sister, who lay dead in the family tomb, wasn't really dead at all. He asked her how long it would take for a person to bleed to death if they were shot, to which she told him she didn't have a clear answer for that. She also said that later he asked her, You think I killed him, don't you? You think I killed Brad, even though this too was before Brad was known to be dead. Even the housekeeping staff would say that blood was noticed in the home on the very afternoon of November 10th, but when asked what happened, Jeremy laughed and said that he had gotten into a fight with a boy from school over a girl. The revelation that Brad Hansen's entire body had been placed in the residential trash bin was startling, and on February 29, 1996, Jeremy Bach was taken into custody in Las Vegas and extradited back to Phoenix. He became the youngest person ordered to stand trial as an adult for murder in Maricopa County at the age of 13. On March 9, 1996, an unprecedented $100,000 search of a portion of the 157,000 cubic feet of horror that is Butterfield Station Landfill would commence. The search lasted into May when temperatures are nestled comfortably in the 90-degree range. Week after week, investigators and volunteers sifted through the designated section of dirt, filth, and garbage, looking for any remnant of Brad's clothing, his shoes, his bike, and find nothing. No bones, no remains of a body that Brad's parents could lay to rest and say their goodbyes to. Roughly a year later, while awaiting the start of his murder trial, Jeremy Bach bonds out of jail on April 12, 1997, after family members pulled together resources to satisfy the $157,000 bail. Upon his release, Dan Bach says that he didn't pay the bond, but he heard that Jeremy's mother made arrangements. Within days, however, he would admit that while she supplied the cash portion, he had put up his Awatuki home as collateral. Brad's mother, Rhonda Michi, was understandably upset, saying, It's so unfair that he's out. He admitted to it. Why is he out? At trial in November 1997, Prosecutor John Ditsworth gave absolutely no motive, but expressed that, whether the body of Brad Hansen had been located yet or not, Jeremy had still admitted that he had listened to and watched his friend gurgle and bleed to death for around an hour and a half, never once deciding to call 911 and get his friend medical attention. Not only did he throw him away like literal garbage, Jeremy listened to music as his friend died and spent the remainder of the morning cleaning up what he thought was all of his friend's blood from the inside of the house. Only Jeremy's attorney, Richard Steinley, and the defense-hired psychologist Brad Bayless spoke on his behalf. They described Jeremy as having low academic achievement around about the fourth grade level and little sense of belonging. Bayless theorized that Jeremy had suffered years of physical and emotional abuse at the hands of Dan Bach and was in dire need of psychological attention and intervention. He said that Jeremy suffered from ADD, paranoia, and self-harm. In short, he was a severely abused child with emotional deficits and handicaps, leading to a kid with extremely poor judgment. He describes Jeremy's early life for the first time, stating that his biological father was in prison and that his mother, Brittany Brown, had married Dan Bach when Jeremy was four years old. Jeremy took his last name and began what Bayless referred to as nine years of severe abuse within the home. 
Dan Bach had evidently broken Brittany's nose and her leg and had hit her in the head with wine bottles in full view of a young, impressionable Jeremy. The defense team also had scathing accusations for Dan Bach, who was not present in the courtroom for his stepson's trial, saying they had suspicions as to the level of involvement he had 